Welcome everyone. We'll just wait for a bit of, for, for more people to join for probably four minutes or so. Well, I think we can, um, we can start. Well, welcome everyone. Welcome everyone to this lecture on soft law and international arbitration as part of the uh, Cambridge Arbitration Society and the Lauterbach Center for International Law Lecture Series. Uh, our speakers today, Professor Anne-Marie uh, Wetzel and Ms. Samba Haridi, have decided to make it uh, to make the lecture today interesting. So it will be an interactive Q&A on the key instruments and uh, development. Uh, so before we start, I would like to introduce our speakers today, whom we're very thrilled uh, to have. And thanks to technology that we're able to have uh, both of them today. Our first speaker is Professor Anne-Marie Wetzel, who is a professor at Georgetown University Law Center and the Lillian Burgram and Faculty Director uh, of the Burgram in International Arbitration and Dispute Resolution at Georgetown Law. Prior to joining Georgetown, she practiced with a law firm uh, in Washington, D.C. and Paris, and she was the Secretary General of the ICC International Court for Arbitration from 2001 to 2007. She also previously taught at the University of Paris, the Paris Institute of Comparative Law and Georgetown. Uh, Ms. Wetzel has acted as arbitrator, counsel, and legal expert in numerous international arbitration cases. She also serves as the director of the Alternative Dispute Resolution Center of the International Law Institute. Ms. Wetzel is admitted to the New York State Bar the District Columbia uh, Bar and the U.S. District Court uh, for the Southern and Eastern District uh, of New York. Welcome, Professor Wetzel, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Ivan. Uh, our second speaker is Ms. Sema Haridi, who is a partner at Hogan Levels and leads Hogan Levels Middle East practice and the co-chair of the IB, uh, IBA uh, International Bar Association Arbitration Committee. She's a civil and common law trained trilingual lawyer with over 20 years of experience in international commercial and investment uh, arbitration under the rules of all major arbitral institutions. Uh, in addition uh, to her work as counsel, Ms. Haridi frequently sits in as, a, as an arbitrator in international commercial and investment disputes. Uh, she is also currently serving as an officer in a number of arbitral organizations, including the, uh, including as a court member of the ICC International um, Court of Arbitration, vice president of the LCI a Arab Users Council and Advisory Committee member of the Cairo Regional Center for International Commercial uh, Arbitration. Uh, Ms. Haridi is a member of the New York, California, and England and Wales uh, Bar. She is fluent in French and Arabic and conversant in Spanish. Uh, welcome, Ms. Haridi, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much, Ibrahim. It's a pleasure to be with all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you for, for joining us today. And my name is Ibrahim al and I'm a PhD uh, candidate at the University of Cambridge and the president of Cambridge Arbitration Society, and I'll be moderating the lecture um, today. So we have a list of questions that we will be addressing, and I think our speakers are happy to take any questions on the uh, spot if they're related uh, to the question asked. So feel free to raise your hand uh, or type your questions and uh, we will address them. Uh, we'll also have 10 to 15 minutes at the end of the lecture to answer any additional questions uh, you may have. Uh, so to start with, uh, Ms. Haridi, uh, we need to know first what is soft law? Uh, that you are the co-chair of the, of the IBA. Um, so what is the soft law in international arbitration? Sure, uh, I'm gonna start answering the question and I think uh, for, for many of the topics we're gonna discuss, both Anne-Marie and I will, uh, will comment and, and I'm sure she's gonna have a lot to say as well. And I have to say, I'm delighted to be doing this program with Anne-Marie. Um, and I'll share with you an anecdote, which is that Anne-Marie and I were opposing counsel in an arbitration many, many years ago. Um, and she was one of the best opponents I've ever had, and also one of the nicest at the same time opponents I've had. And it's, uh, it's wonderful when you're able to build uh, relationships like that with, uh, with someone sitting across the table from you. Um, so, so really particularly delighted uh, to always be working and, and collaborating with Professor Whitesell. All right, so the topic of soft law, uh, you're right to start there, Ibrahim, what is it? 
Um, I'm going to start by giving you kind of the official or scientific answer to this question, and then we'll, we'll take it from there. Soft law are norms that generally are known that they're, they cannot be enforced through public force. They are soft by definition, so um, they don't have a binding force per se, um, and, they, and they are weaker, in, so to speak, than traditional law, which we refer to traditionally as hard law. And these characteristics are due to potentially two phenomenons, um, either because they're not concrete enough to be really characterized as hard law, they essentially set out general objectives or principles, so there's nothing really more concrete than that, or another reason is because they are promulgated as soft law, meaning that they don't have a mandatory effect, like a code of conduct, for example, and we'll come back to uh, that topic of, of codes of conduct. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it cannot be binding. It also means that it can be what the parties want it to be, um, in the sense that parties can decide in arbitral proceedings to take a set of soft law and make it binding in their proceeding. They can also take it and say, it's just going to have a guide, guiding effect, which oftentimes arbitrators do in arbitrations. But, you know, generally speaking, the objectives of soft law and the reason they're created is to put together, compile norms or practices into a single non-dispersed body in an effort to harmonize. And, and I'll come back to that concept when we start discussing some of the bodies of soft law, particularly at the IBA level. Um, and it's also to create new norms that are meant to encourage certain behavior. Um, the idea, again, being to bring these norms together to encourage a more uh, harmonized set of behaviors in, in a given environment. Um, it, it can be a fairly ambitious objective, uh, but, but it, it does work as, as we will see. And just to give you some ideas, and I think all of you here, and I recognize, by the way, the names of a number of attendees here and, and thank everyone for joining, uh, are familiar with some of them. You know, for example, the Unidrop principles um, uh, are, you know, sometimes can be referred to as soft law depending again on how the parties wish to uh, adopt them. The UN Global Compact principles uh, on corporate sustainability norms or um, the draft common frame of reference, which is an aggregation of EU private laws or the uh, international financial accounting standards, or as we will come to discuss more, IBA soft law. And maybe a couple of words on the IBA for those of you who don't know it. The International Bar Association is one of the world's leading associations of law professionals and bar associations. It was established in 1947, seven, sorry, it, had enough, it has over 80,000 lawyer members and over 190 bar association members. It is the most active organization when it comes to creating international arbitration soft law instruments. Um, and through the arbitration committee, of which I'm currently the co-chair, we've created um, with the co-chairs that came before me, a number of soft law instruments, which are commonly used in international arbitration proceedings. Um, and as part of these, we're going to be talking today about the IBA guidelines on conflicts of interest in international arbitration, the IBA guidelines on party representation, and the IBA rules of evidence, or, or the IBA rules on the taking of evidence in international arbitration. And I think we'll, we'll get to dive in a little bit on some of these down the road, but perhaps let me stop here. And I hope that I gave a little bit of an overview of what soft law is. Um, and Marie, maybe you wanna comment on that as well. So thank you. I would also like to start by thanking the organizers and in particular Ibrahim, whom I had the pleasure to know during his stay at Georgetown. I'm so happy to see him today and to be able to participate with Sama, who, as she indicated, we have a, a long friendship uh, that goes back many, many years. 
uh, but I'm also very happy to see at Cambridge that you are um, having this arbitration society because it's very important in an educational environment uh, for arbitration to be promoted. So bravo uh, to Ibrahim and to your colleagues for the Cambridge Arbitration Society. Now, coming back to soft law, um, of course, I agree with everything Sama has said so far. Um, just to add a few more points, perhaps, I would say that uh, with globalization uh, during these past years, what we have seen is an enormous increase in soft law. And that has uh, arrived because we have been looking for ways to create legal norms that go beyond borders. And so uh, what is interesting is that instead of states and, and sovereign states creating this law, we're seeing it being created by perhaps private associations, trade organizations, institutions. And, and so that is very different than our traditional conception of what law is. Um, Sama talked about many of the codes uh, that we will discuss later today, but I would also highlight that soft law is not always codified. Uh, and so uh, there can be practices that don't ever make it into codes, but that still remain an important part of soft law. Uh, Sama, you also mentioned the question of enforceability. And quite correctly, you mentioned that uh, soft law is soft until the parties may decide to um, make it a binding agreement. To, they'll put something in their contract or they'll reach an agreement that these soft law principles will apply and then it becomes enforceable. Uh, but even when it's not part of the party's agreement, many uh, parties think of soft law as being enforceable just because of the stature of institutions like the IBA. So soft law is playing this uh, role and can be perceived as binding even when it is not. And, and that's an interesting uh, aspect of the importance of certain organizations. And then finally, I would say, looking at soft law and international arbitration, uh, we will mostly be considering procedural soft law uh, because that's what international arbitration makes the most use of. Uh, but soft law can also exist in substantive form. Uh, and Sama, you mentioned Unidwa principles as an example, but those principles are not strictly limited to international arbitration. And so that's why I think when you talk about soft law and international arbitration, most of the time it is more procedural. So those are just a few points I wanted to add to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Harid and Professor Wetzel. Um, on this, so for the interest of time, we we want to get into the uh, into the uh, uh, into the the details and the depth of of soft law. So it's sensible to address one of the issues that came into the spotlight after the UK Supreme Court uh, decision in Halberton Chubb versus Chubb um, on arbitrators conflicts of interest. So the question is. What are the key considerations uh, when evaluating whether an arbitrator has a conflict of interest, and what are the consequences we have seen in in Chubb, um, the consequences of of such uh, non disclosure? Uh, so, what are the consequences of a failure to dis to, to disclose? And probably um, a comment on on uh, Halberton versus Chubb, in which it seems that the arbitrator arguably run an orange light using the IPA classification of conflicts of interests? So I'm going to start on, on this question. Uh, and I, I do think conflicts of interest is a wonderful area to talk about soft law, uh, because we see the impact of soft law on everyone. We see the impact on the arbitrators. We see the impact on the parties, on the institutions, and even on the courts. Uh, and so to start with, what should an arbitrator uh, consider? Again, before we get to soft law, you have to take into account if there are any national law requirements. I think that's always the starting point. And although now living in this international world, we sometimes think that all national laws are the same. It is not true. Uh, and so there do remain certain requirements under different national laws that an arbitrator would first have to consider. 
uh, then we would also have to look at the institutional rules if it is an institutional arbitration and the arbitrator will have to comply with those institutional rules. So all of that is taking place before we get to the soft law uh, requirements and in particular these IBA guidelines on conflicts of interest. Um, now, also I should mention the arbitrator has to look at the arbitration agreement because the agreement may also have specific requirements. And again, this may not necessarily be conflict, but the arbitrator has to satisfy the requirements of the clause to be able to accept uh, the arbitration. Now, talking about soft law, law, though, in this area, I think it is particularly difficult because conflicts of interest are so culturally related, and it is very difficult to generalize soft law, what it has done is try to harmonize, provide a, a, a baseline for everyone as to what should be disclosed, uh, what is not necessary to be disclosed. But again, it's extremely dependent upon the context. And to codify is going to be very, very difficult because you can't codify every situation. And so if we look at these IBA guidelines on conflicts of interest, for example, there are the general principles that try to capture the spirit, uh, the principles that should apply. And then we have the list of examples, the, the red, orange, and green lists. Uh, but in my own experience, uh, there are so many uh, instances where the possible uh, conflict is not found on those lists. And that's just because it's impossible to codify every situation. And even if it's on the list, as you may know, the IBA um, has tried to, at a time period, there's a three year period during which most of these conflicts are, are supposed to be disclosed. Uh, and, and that again is just so context driven. And so if I, for example, were the arbitrator and something had happened four years ago, would I disclose it? Yes, even if the IBA would tell me that it didn't have to be disclosed because of the three-year limit. And so again, um, looking at the impact of soft law on the, the, what the arbitrator is going to disclose, the arbitrator has to always be aware that the institutions are not going to be bound by that soft law. So the ICC has specifically come out and said, for example, that the ICC will apply its own practices and will not be, again, bound by the IBA guidelines unless the parties have made it part of their agreement. And it's the same thing for the courts. So looking at what an arbitrator must consider, all of that to say, and, and that brings you to the, the Halliburton case, is the arbitrator has to take into account the particular context of the of the procedure in which that arbitrator is going to act. Now, uh, what happens when an arbitrator does not disclose? Uh, as we have seen, there will be different reactions in different jurisdictions and even by uh, the different institutions. And so that also is, is very hard to codify um, because in most jurisdictions, failure to disclose something will not be enough to disqualify an arbitrator. We're going to look at what is it that the arbitrator failed to disclose. Is that a true conflict? The fact that a disclosure was not made may lead to arguments that the arbitrator is not impartial, but it's generally not going to be enough to disqualify that arbitrator. I say that because there are jurisdictions where they take a harder stance on that question. So the answer is, very hard to codify uh, conflicts of interest. Soft law has tried, and I think it's, it's, a, it's a good exercise because it does provide a baseline for everyone to start from, but then you have to be very careful uh, in looking at where are you uh, and look at the, the context that surrounds the dispute. Yeah, I, I would echo everything that Professor Whitesell has said um, and um, just maybe a couple of comments on this very, very interesting topic. And in fact, um, the IBA is going to be holding a conference next week um, on this topic of um, RB, arbitrator disclosures and, and Halliburton versus Chubb. I will be moderating one of the two panels then. And so anybody who's interested to, to join um, 
just look it up on the IDA website. I, I, it, there's a lot of speakers who are very, very knowledgeable on this topic who will be participating. Um, it, it's it's in, incredibly difficult. It's an area where it's incredibly, incredibly different, difficult to codify. Mm -hmm. The IDA Arbitration Committee looked very deeply at whether the guidelines on conflict of interest should be updated and decided against it. Um, the, the general sentiment is that the, the committee has gone as far as it can in terms of establishing a framework. Beyond that, as I think Professor Whitesell explained, you really do have to look at the spe specific circumstances and the Chubb case is an excellent example of that. And I don't mean to say excellent to congratulate the outcome of that decision. <laughs> I think there are aspects of this decision that are questionable. Um, but it shows you how uh, detail-oriented the court was in looking at different criteria, rightfully or wrongly. For example, the timing of the disclosure versus the timing of the analysis of the apparent bias seemed to be at uh, different times. The, 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 the particular type of arbitration at issue, Bermuda form arbitration versus commercial arbitration, there seems to be a distinction drawn there. Um, the court seemed to look also at what the role of a core arbitrator is, as if there was still this perception that a core arbitrator is somehow acting uh, primarily or by default in favor of the party that appointed it, which as we know in the international commercial arbitration space is not at all the case. Um, so, so there are a lot of aspects uh, and, and a lot of fact-specific issues that one has to look at when deciding, and Anne-Marie is better placed than I to, to also uh, comment even from the institutional perspective. I sit on the ICC court. She was the secretary general of the ICC court for a number of years, and I've sat through a number of discussions involving issues of failure to disclose and what the impact of those are. And I can tell you from having sat on those discussions, you really do need to look at the specifics uh, and ultimately assess, you know, what, what happened. The other piece of it, as I found in my own experience sitting as arbitrator, is it oftentimes really will be a question for the arbitrator himself or herself to evaluate based on his or her own normative values, what their behavior should be vis-a-vis -vis specific issues. It's amazing to me the disparity with which people look at the same issue through a completely different lens. Um, part of the purpose of soft law, as I hope you, you know, I said in answer to the first question, is to try to bring a little bit these different outlooks together in one more harmonized sphere. It's not an easy objective. And I suspect we will continue to evolve in a world where judgment you know, is a big part of how these decisions are made. Yeah. If I could just add to Sema, for the, for the IBA guidelines, also what's very interesting is the orange list. That's where all the interesting questions yeah. fall. And the problem with the orange list is that it's talking about disclosure, but then it doesn't tell us what to do with that disclosure. And so that's where soft law, again, shows its limit that it, it, it gives us an idea of what the international community thinks should be disclosed, but then it falls on the arbitrator, the institution, particularly the institution to decide what to do with that disclosure. And so that's where, again, we see soft law does have its limits. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so moving to another uh, topic, uh, an interesting uh, issue, which is the Council conduct in arbitration, uh, which is a debatable issue, and the IBA guidelines on party representation has addressed that. Um, so the question is, how should council conduct themselves in international arbitration? Um, I'll I'll start, and um, and we can take it from here. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, um, the IBA did uh, promulgate um, some guidelines or, or maybe promulgate is not the right term, given that we are talking about soft law, but uh, come out with, with some guidelines on party representation back in 2008. 
Um, maybe just a quick background uh, on, on how this came together. There was a task force. Their mandate was to look at the issue of council conduct and party representation in international arbitration. And I can tell you, part of what was really troubling those who were involved in this effort were very, very different ways of looking at questions like disclosures and an and obligation to disclose evidence that is harmful to your party. Um, and, and the legal cultures are drastically different, as I think we all know, when it comes to questions like that, or questions of privilege, attorney-client privilege, just to name a couple of example, examples. Um, before these guidelines came out, council conduct was basically unregulated in the context of international arbitration outside of specific ethics rules that of course govern otherwise the conduct of council in their own respective jurisdictions. So the task force commissioned the survey, uh, a number of respondents all over the world said it would be nice to have some guidelines for party representation. And then the draft guidelines were born from there. They were shared with many, many users, arbitrators, institutions, academics, et cetera. And they were adopted in May of 2013 by the IBA Council. They are not intended to be a code of ethics for lawyers in international arbitration. They are addressed to party representatives specifically. And they, of course, do not displace, because they cannot, mandatory rules, including the bar rules that govern the council's conduct and ethics in their own jurisdiction. They address a number of issues, and I'm just going to brush very quickly through them, issues like what if a party appoints counsel late in the game that may create a conflict with one of the arbitrators? How do you deal with these kinds of situations? There are some famous cases, actually, that gave rise to this particular guideline. Or what are the best practices for communicating with arbitrators? There are jurisdictions today where it's not unheard of for a party to have ex parte communications with an arbitrator. So how do we deal with that? Um, the duty of candor and honesty in the submissions made by counsel to the tribunal, not making false statements of fact, not coaching a witness in making false statements. Um, what should parties do about preserving documents, retaining documents at the outset of a dispute? Or what should a counsel do to prepare a witness? It's a very, very um, uh, interesting and popular topic which is that of preparation of witness for testimony. And there are very interesting distinctions, as we know, in the UK, uh, for barristers in particular, who are restricted in some way from engaging in this behavior. So these guidelines are strictly limited to the conduct of the procedure, not to the relation between counsel and their client. Uh, and I will mention that some arbitral institutions, including the LCIA in 2014, actually followed suit and issued some rules regarding counsel's conduct in an annex to the LCIA rules. I will say these guidelines on party representations are not widely used, at least in my experience, certainly not nearly as much as the IBA rules on the taking of evidence, but they have, I think, done a good job of bridging the gap in the field of arbitration and bringing a little bit more, again, harmonization to how some issues are considered uh, in uh, arbitration procedures. So to add to what Sam has said, I think these, these um, IBA guidelines, again, are very helpful because they work towards that harmonization of different standards. But the problem is, as soft law, how can they be enforced? And so I think, again, this is showing us the importance of soft law in creating norms, but when we get down to how to actually give it effect, uh, that's where we see some issues. And so the LCIA's reaction, Sam, what you mentioned is very interesting because once it becomes part of the institutional rules, then you have a body that's able to sanction the behavior. And in those LCIA rules, which they've continued now in this 2021 uh, revision, the, um, the arbitrators actually have the power to sanction the behavior 
of counsel. And I think that's that's very strong. You don't find that in many of the other institutional rules. But it's to take it beyond soft law where we're trying to talk about what a council should or should not do to actually having some ability to uh, sanction behavior that's not proper. And I think that shows the, the role that institutions can play taking it beyond just being soft law. Uh, but otherwise, it's very difficult to deal with these questions of, of lawyer behavior. I think the IBA idea of coming out with these guidelines was wonderful, though, because it um, put some responsibility back on the lawyers, uh, that there was a code that they should be respecting. So it's not just the arbitrators, it's not just the institutions, but also the lawyers had this role to play. Yeah, absolutely. So we have some questions on, on disclosure, which I think is a really interesting topic. Uh, we'll address them probably at the end. I have a follow up question on the on the uh, uh, on council contact. So sometimes, you know, some rules open up a chance for council to use legislative shortcomings and engage in what's known to be, you know, guerrilla tactics. So has the time come for a uniform, enforceable a global code for ethical conduct of counsel in international arbitration, or, or not yet? It's, I would say, I don't particularly, even, even though I tend to favor and encourage uh, soft law when needed, um, I, I think good measure is always, you know, the way to go. I don't necessarily subscribe to the view that everything should be codified. Um, and more specifically, in answer to your question, I start from the premise that the parties should, when they go into arbitration, trust that the decision makers and the tribunal members are going to do what's needed to bring an orderly process uh, into these proceedings and to ensure that the rules of the game are followed and, and so on. So I, I personally like to put my trust and, and, um, and my reliance on the arbitrators whom I do think should be able to play that role. Sometimes they don't, but they should be. Um, and I think that with the proper exercise of authority, uh, we are in a good place with what we have, and, um, and, and the arbitrators should not be shy about using the authority given to them to ensure the proper conduct of counsel in arbitration proceedings. I would add also that the idea of coming up with a universal code of conduct raises this problem of who is going to enforce it. And so it, it is, again, not worth it to have a code, again, unless it's just to raise awareness. But if you can't sanction something, then it isn't really that useful. So I agree completely with Sama that arbitrators need to feel comfortable being able to take hard decisions and not feel threatened that taking those kind of decisions is going to uh, raise issues. And I'd be careful when people talk about guerrilla tactics. Again, that's kind of a, a jargon in, the, in our field. But, you know, to one lawyer, what's a guerrilla tactic uh, to another lawyer might just be good, aggressive New York lawyering. <laughs> so, um, again, very, very difficult to codify what is, what is good behavior. It depends so much on the context of the case. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, to support these remarks, I recall the Swiss Arbitration Association Working Group on, on Council Ethics uh, in 2016 has decided the same, that the time hasn't come for, for, an, for international and global uh, uh, code for, for uh, Council. So, Professor Wetzel, going back to the failure to disclose by arbitrators, uh, should there be a code of ethics for arbitrators? Um, so, so for them to be clear whether they should disclose or not. 
So, Ibrahim, you're going to hear me repeat what I just said about, again, having codes of ethics, you need to have people that can enforce, you need to have a body responsible for enforcing them. Yeah, absolutely. Now, what, what you're talking about now, a code of ethics for arbitrators is a very hot topic, uh, because as everyone knows, ICSID and UNCITRAL have been working on their draft code of conduct for adjudicators in international investment disputes. Uh, and so the, that the idea is for them to come up with this code, but recognizing, I think, the problems of keeping it as soft law, uh, they've come up just this month with a note on how uh, that code would be implemented. And so they are taking it beyond to actually, again, have the possibility of that code uh, having sanctions. And so I think that that is going to work. Uh, but it will depend again on the context. So they are talking about, again, that the code would be incorporated into multilateral instruments, that it would do be done treaty by treaty, that it would be based on an agreement of the parties, or it would form part of the procedural rules of the institution, or even that you would require arbitrators when they do their declaration to say that they agree to abide by this code, et cetera. So they are clearly looking at making this more than just pure soft law, but giving it some teeth. And so that idea of a code of ethics that again, can have somebody able to sanction it, uh, that is a good thing. But just this idea of everyone drafting different codes of conduct, I personally don't think it's a good idea. You run the risk of having conflicting provisions. You, um, again, you also run the, this possibility of people not taking it as seriously because there are just so many, there's been this explosion of codes. And we see codes like the ABA, again, with, with the very good intentions to try and provide a baseline, to try and harmonize, coming out with a code, but uh, it has no teeth to it. Again, unless in some way it becomes part of the party's agreement or part of the institutional, uh, institutional rules. And I would just very briefly add that the IBA did look at this question of whether there should be a code of conduct. Uh, I can't list uh, uh, the, the number of, of uh, members who reached out um, suggesting that some, some initiative of that nature be taken. Um, so the arbitration committee looked at this very closely um, a couple of years ago and determined that with the IBA guidelines on conflict of interest and the IBA guidelines on party representation, that there was sufficient guidance uh, on the relevant topics from the arbitration committee's perspective, that there was no need uh, to uh, prepare a code of conduct um, in addition to the existing body of soft law that currently exists. And Ibrahim, I would add that this kind of explosion of codes of conduct for arbitrators, it really it shows how the arbitration community has changed because previously it was a very small club and arbitrators all knew how each other, uh, how they were behaving. And there wasn't necessarily a need to have a code because it was an unwritten code that everyone knew. And so the positive is that the world has expanded, the arbitration community has expanded. And so we can no longer count on people's just pure reputation as being a way of sanctioning uh, their ethical behavior. And so these codes are showing us basically, you know, some of the growing pains of international arbitration in a positive way. Thank you. Thank you so much. So before we leave the disclosure issue, we have two questions uh, on that. Uh, we have a question from uh, Olga TC. Um, he says that the decision in Greece disqualifies an arbitrator because of having not disclosed information that led to non-impartiality. And the same apparently uh, was asked by uh, Remo uh, Caprici, uh, he said the U.S. Court of the Fifth Circuit recently decided in a very similar way to the Greece, uh, to, to Greece regarding the arbitration. So, do you, your comments on on this? Is it is that is the non-disclosure enough for disqualifying an arbitrator? 
I believe, as I said, it, it does vary jurisdiction by jurisdiction. And what's interesting in the US, uh, that it varies circuit by circuit. And so if we look at uh, New York, the Second Circuit, there's a different approach to this question than if we go to the Ninth Circuit in California. Uh, so that's why, again, you have to be very careful. And it is for certain that in some places, non-disclosure could be considered enough uh, for the arbitrator to be disqualified. I don't think that's the general approach, but that it, it clearly is an approach that you will find in some jurisdictions. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think it's impossible to answer this question in the abstract in the sense of it all depends on what is it that's not being disclosed. Um, are you not disclosing that you were a par appointed by the same party 18 times in the last five years? Or are you not disclosing that you're sitting currently in one case involving counsel for one of the parties? You know, it's, it's a very, very fact intensive analysis that requires um, really as much as possible of, of an objective assessment of uh, whether in the mind of a reasonable person, um, knowing the information that had not been disclosed would have changed their view, would have led them to not want that, that arbitrator or to challenge or to just not pick that arbitrator as they, the case may be. Uh, but I think you cannot dissociate this question of failure to disclose from what is it that we are actually talking about ultimately. And Ibrahim, you, you have cases, for example, where the arbitrator is acting in related cases where you may have the same counsel even involved and the arbitrator doesn't make the disclosure because the arbitrator says everybody already knew. Yeah. And, and so that's why, again, it is so context driven. Um, yeah, absolutely. As Emma has just said. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. So moving from that, uh, we we uh, we want to ask a question about the the evidence uh, in international arbitration. So, what are the rules governing taking of evidence in international arbitration, and how have they evolved over the years? Uh, sure, I'll I'll give you a quick overview, being mindful of our time again, and and just hoping that we can um, uh, have time to to cover some of the other topics. So the IBA rules of evidence on the taking of evidence started as the IBA rules on the taking of evidence in international commercial arbitration in 1999. That was when there was really a first attempt to combine aspects of both civil and common law practices for the taking of evidence in international commercial arbitration proceedings. They were designed as supplementary evidentiary rules that parties or the arbitral tribunal can adopt regardless of the substantive or procedural law governing the proceedings. They have definitely become increasingly important and used in international arbitration proceedings, both in commercial and now also treaty-based uh, proceedings. And that's in fact why the word commercial was dropped from the title uh, a, a few years ago. The revised version prior to the one that was published this year came out in 2010. And more recently, as you've heard, um, we uh, revised and updated those rules in 2020. There's also, by the way, an interesting set of rules you may have heard of called the Rules on the Efficient Conduct of Proceedings in International Arbitration, better known as the Prague Rules, which were promulgated in 2019, which follow, I think is fair to say, a more inquisitorial approach that is familiar, of course, to civil law practitioners. And we may or may not have time to talk more about the Prague rules, but I wanted to mention them. Um, as far as the IBA rules, as I said, we looked at uh, whether a revision was needed for, to the 2010 rules. And uh, some revisions started in May 2019. And the IBA Council adopted the revisions, uh, the most recent ones, on December 17, 2020, so very recently and they were released just in February of this year. I would say overall, these rules cover topics like document production, expert related proceedings, how do you handle the presentation of evidence at the hearing uh, and so on. And um, in terms of the recent um, changes, they really were not drastic. They were really just meant to improve clarity uh, and of course address the elephant in the room, 
of dealing with the pandemic and the uh, now prominence of remote and technological uh, hearings, you know, using technology and, uh, and, and just clarifying certain ambiguities. These rules can be adopted as guidelines, aka, again, soft law, but they can be made binding. So once they are made binding by, you know, as agreed in, in many cases by the parties in arbitration proceedings, the tribunal then really does have a mechanism to apply and enforce these rules by election, basically, uh, in those situations where the parties agree to have those rules apply. They can apply in whole or in part. That's actually an innovation that made, became more clear with the 2020 revisions. Um, and the core principle, I will say, that underlie these rules is to make sure the procedure, proceedings related to evidence are economical, fair, and efficient, um, and, um, and, and ensuring that the parties conduct themselves in good faith. And I'll stop here just in the interest of time. So I think looking again from an outsider perspective, the these IBA uh, rules on the taking of evidence are probably the, the most well known and the most used of the soft law uh, products. And I, I believe there was a survey that was taken on the Kluwer arbitration blog a few years ago and the IBA evidence rules came out at the top as being the soft law that is most applied by uh, members of the arbitration community. So that's an enormous contribution that the IBA has given to international arbitration. As Sama has said, the, the binding effect of those rules is for the parties to decide with the arbitrators. And I think it's very important in a case uh, to keep that in mind uh, because often arbitrators do want to still keep some flexibility. And so you take from the rules what is going to be useful uh, for you to, again, have everyone working from the same baseline. Uh, but personally, I would always like to keep some room for discretion. Um, but that's what, the, and as Sema has just said, it's become even clearer. That's what these new IBA rules allow you to, to kind of pick and choose. Uh, but a wonderful, wonderful contribution for international arbitration. Thank you so much. So we have two questions and we'll give two minutes for each and then we'll take some questions from, from the audience. So the first is what should the rule of arbitral institution be in the context of promoting uh, soft law? So that's back to me, I guess, Ibrahim. So Being the institution, they, they play an extremely important role vis-a-vis uh, -vis soft law. And that's in two ways, because first of all, the institutional rules themselves are soft law until they become incorporated into a party's agreement. The, the rules are just out there as soft law and they are used as an example. So one institution's rules will be copied by many other institution. Uh, and the institutions develop practice notes and guidance notes. And so all of that is, again, helping with the evolution of international arbitration. And I would say, and I know maybe I'm not neutral, but that institutions probably are the greatest force in driving evolutions in international arbitration because through all of the cases that they administer, they see the problems, the advantages, et cetera, and they're able to adapt their rules, which then again goes out into the international arbitration world. So as far as, again, their own rules, their own products, when they remain soft law, uh, that's an enormous advantage that the institutions take for promoting themselves and international arbitration. Looking at soft law that's not coming from the institution itself, so, so uh, IBA uh, rules and guidelines, et cetera, um, I think there again, uh, soft law will be applied in these institutional proceedings. The institutions know it. And so they have an interest in making sure that soft law is as good as possible. And that's why institutions like the IBA, uh, they go to the institutions and ask for input on the soft law and the institutions participate in the development of that soft law uh, because they know, again, it's going to show up in, in their cases. And um, so it's extremely important, though, for the institutions to make clear the role that soft law will play, 
the ICC is not going to be bound by those IBA guidelines on conflicts, again, unless the parties make them binding. Otherwise, the institution is going to apply its own rules and its own practices. Thank you. So, uh, Ms. Haridi, are more guidelines needed for uh, the good conduct of arbitral proceedings? Is, is codification helpful? Uh, is, is codification a helpful process in international arbitration? And what are some of the potential downsides of codification? So uh, I think, as I mentioned earlier, I do welcome and I'm a proponent of soft law when it can be helpful and when, can it ha when it can help bridge the gap. But that doesn't mean, as I said earlier, that we should just codify everything for the sake of it. Um, I will tell you, you know, a lot of people, especially when the guidelines on party representation came out, um, questioned the legitimacy of the IBA to develop these soft law rules, particularly those guidelines. But I will, I, I very much agree with the views of Alex Simour, who is the current president of the ICC Court of Arbitration, who said, you know, this legitimacy relies on three factors. In order to enact soft law, you have to have experience in rulemaking, which of course the IBA has. You have to be inclusive. And, and the IBA has done that time and time again, consulting the, IE, the international arbitration community as widely as possible. Practitioners, academics, users, arbitrators, institutions, and so on. And it also has to reflect internationality and reflect the wide cultural diversity of the arbitral community. We're not talking about codifying the common law way of doing something or the civil law way of doing something. We're trying to codify or bring together different norms and, and, and meet somewhere in the middle. That I think is the right approach. And those factors are what bring uh, that legitimacy to the soft laws that are developed at least at the IBA level. So I will say, you know, for those who think there should just be no norms, nothing at all, in my view, just because arbitration is premised on party autonomy, which of course it is, doesn't mean it, it cannot or shouldn't self-regulate. Some degree of self-regulation is a good thing, in my view. It is okay to have some form of codification of a common framework that is acceptable to all. It still, by the way, doesn't steal the ability to do creative thinking, to regulate proceedings at the arbitral tribunal level. These soft laws are not meant to micromanage, um, but they are meant to just provide a framework. And more and most importantly, and to me that is the single most important objective, it is meant to ensure an equal playing field between the participants in the proceedings. So to me, Soft law has gained, for, for rightfully so, an increasing importance in the world of international arbitration. It has contributed to leveling the playing field, to increase certainty, to codify best practices, to provide guidance on how to tackle some concerns. Um, and the IBA has done a good job in terms of creating soft law that um, codifies some of these general principles and, and establishes legitimacy in doing so um, and, and uh, allowing it to continue to provide soft law that meets some of the challenges uh, that we still encounter in, in the practice of international arbitration. Thank you, thank you. So we have, we have a number of questions and I'm gonna summarize them and they go back to the same, uh, to the first question we have asked about what is, uh, Soft law. So we have we have a question uh, about whether un whether there are unwritten rules uh, or unwritten soft laws, and whether the Queen Mary reports and other similar reports uh, whether they are considered to be soft law. Uh, we have also a question on the same uh, area that uh, that asks about the difference between substantive law and procedural law and soft law. Um, uh, uh, or the interplay between substantive law and procedural laws and where the soft law uh, stands there. Uh, 
I could start on the first question about um, the Queen Mary studies, et cetera. These are just surveys. I don't consider them personally as constituting norms. Soft law is still based upon um, identifying norms that are given global application. Those surveys are more interested in studying how soft law gets applied, but I don't think they themselves constitute soft law. There are, though, uh, as I started out by saying, um, principles of soft law that do not end up in codes uh, where they're just in the practice. And, and so, um, yes, soft law could be uncodified. It becomes codified, I believe, when uh, there is an interest in taking into account existing norms and putting them into some kind of structure. I have nothing to add on this question. I think Anne-Marie covered it perfectly. Um, yeah, t tell us, uh, maybe it's easier to take them one by one so we can keep track of the sure. question. Yeah, sure. Uh, so I, uh, the other question is the substantive and the procedural laws and where the soft law stands there. I think that's a topic you covered, Professor Whitesell. So maybe you can, you can address it and I'm happy to comment on as well. But you mentioned that it was primarily procedural law that is relevant in the field of arbitration. Because every arbitration will have some type of applicable law, whether it's a national law or it's a general principles of international uh, law. But th this question of substantive law, there are uh, bodies of law, and Sam identified some of them. I take the UNIDWA principles as a good example, which they will get applied in international arbitration. There are cases where the parties say that the dispute will be governed by the UNIDWA principles, but they're not unique to arbitration. So you could have the UNIDWA principles in arbitration, you could have them in, in, in a different context. And that's why I say in the development of international arbitration, what we've seen is use of these substantive soft laws, but really the development of procedural laws that are procedural soft law that is specific to international arbitration. So that's where I see the greatest contribution. Perfect. Absolutely. You so and and on, you know, on the unit draw principles, it, it's, it's certainly um, the most common example. And, and, and another example of whether situations where it can be soft law or it can be incorporated as mandatory law. And I'll just tell you that many international organizations, including the United Nations, actually um, basically refer to the UNIDRA principles as the governing law in their contracts because they do not, as an international organization, want to be bound to the laws of a particular nation for policy and other reasons. So the majority of the UN contracts actually provide for UNIDRAW as governing law. And in those circumstances, it is binding. It is no longer a soft law. It is actually a set of principles that govern the, uh, the substantive rights of the parties. The problem with that is that they're very general. Um, I've litigated some cases uh, under those rules and I can tell you it's a very complicated task to be advocating uh, when, when your applicable substantive governing law is nothing but a set of general principles. It, it, it leaves room for very creative thinking and lawyering. <laughs> Thank you. So our last question is, what are the new developments in the soft laws in regard to online hearings contacts? Uh, and are there any, any new protocols or, or rules on that regard? Um, maybe I'll start um, and tell you, with respect to the IBA rules on the taking of evidence and the revisions of 2020, um, those revisions allow now specifically for remote hearings. Um, and so basically they, they um, account for the increased availability and reliability and necessity of video conferencing technology. And I'll even read to you what they currently say. So it says, at the request of a party or on its own motion, the tribunal may, after consulting with the parties, order that the evidentiary hearing be conducted as a remote hearing. Um, and that in that event, the tribunal shall consult with the parties with a view to establishing a remote hearing protocol to conduct the hearing efficiently, fairly, and so on. 
And um, there are a number of such protocols that have been developed. In fact, I was responsible for drafting a protocol that my firm put out uh, when the pandemic started um, that touches on everything you can think of from you know, what um, platform should be used, uh, how to organize questions like documents. You know, when you're interviewing a witness or questioning a witness, how do you make sure that witness uh, uh, has access to the documents that you're asking about? Uh, issues having to do with witness swearing in. You know, how do you swear a witness on Zoom? Um, how do you ensure that a witness is not being coached? You can't see who's in the room with them. Uh, how do you deal with that? Do you have them say something in the beginning that there's nobody talking to them or that they don't have a phone under the table WhatsApping with someone from counsel's team? Um, so, so these protocols have been developed by uh, not only a number of, of uh, firms like mine, but a number of institutions, of course, have also developed fairly comprehensive protocols and procedural order drafts dealing with uh, these uh, remote hearings. And I would say we're basically on autopilot at this point, given where we are today uh, and where we were in March of 2020. Um, it's now become the norm. I would just add uh, what Sama has said about these protocols, again, as long as it just remains soft law, it still left open this question of, of enforceability. And um, so that what we saw happening was that the institutional rules were actually changed. And we saw that with the ICC revising its rules, the LCIA revising its rules, although I believe the LCIA already permitted it. but. Um, th to have it in the rules so it was binding uh, because it was a, a very easy way for a party to try and block a procedure to say, I want an in-person hearing and I refuse to, avert, to participate in a vir virtual hearing. Uh, so the institutions had to respond quickly. Uh, but at the end of the day, what we have seen on this question is that it comes back to the courts. And very interestingly, just ICA, the International Council for Commercial Arbitration today announced that they've just published another series of reports, uh, national reports on the possibility of holding uh, virtual hearings. And so what we have seen is that the courts have been supportive of the possibility for arbitrators to hold virtual hearings. So this is a beautiful example of where arbitration has to uh, be a system that works with everyone together. So we need soft law working with enforceable law. We need the courts working with arbitrators. We need the institutions working with the uh, courts and the arbitrators. And so virtual hearings have let arbitration show, you know, how it is so well adapted to evolving when it has to. Yeah, absolutely. And soft law also is helpful in the, the transition period, such as when we moved from, from in-person to online hearings and, and we saw some protocols coming in. And I remember the, the, the CEO protocol, which was one of the, 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 the first protocols in online hearing and how to conduct and deal with, with agreements that, uh, that was designed for, for uh, in-person hearing. Uh, well, I think this, this brings us to, to the end of the lecture today. So thank you so much, Professor Weitzel and, and Ms. Haridi for taking the time to speak um, to our society today and for the wonderful remarks and the presentation. And thank you everyone um, for attending. Uh, I would like to remind everyone to follow us on social media uh, platforms, uh, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, uh, for more events uh, and lectures. Uh, so thank you so much, uh, Professor Weitzel, and thank you again, um, Ms. Haridi. Thank you, Ibrahim. And, and even though we can hold our hearings virtually, we hope to hold our next conference in person. Absolutely, absolutely. Hope, hope exactly. to see you in Cambridge. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Ibrahim. Thank you, Professor Weissel. It was such a pleasure. And I hope the next one is in person indeed. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.